This is the Bristol Flyers podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Bristol Flyers podcast with me, your host, Joel Osborne. It's uh, definitely been a while since I said that, hasn't it? <laughs> but we are back and we've got a brand new sponsor in UWE Bristol. And a huge thank you from everyone at Bristol Flyers to UWE Bristol for, for sponsoring the podcast, who have recently teamed up with Amazon to create Alexa's first university prospectus. So if you're considering your university options, you can just ask Alexa to open UWE Guide to discover what they offer, all tailored to suit your individual needs and interests. Well, coming up, episode five, we've got Teddy Okoreafor and Ben Mockford straight from GB International Duty after qualifying for the Eurobasket 2022. So a, uh, a great interview here. We talk about uh, what it's like behind the scenes in camp, playing in a bubble, and also a bit about uh, coming over to play for Bristol Flyers. Uh, and without further ado, here it is. It's episode five with Teddy Okoreafor and Ben Mockford. This is the Bristol Flyers podcast. All right, time to welcome in our guest for episode five of the Bristol Flyers podcast. And fresh off the plane uh, from international duty is Teddy Okorea for and Ben Mockford. Fellas, how's it going? Good, man. Good, man. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. This is actually the first like Bristol Flyers podcast you've ever done in person. Like, everything else has been done via Zoom. So right, this is the right. first one we've actually done face to face. So you guys uh, should feel pretty privileged. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. This is good. <laughs> Uh, uh, for obviously, first of all, like I've got to say, congratulations on like qualifying for Eurobasket. Like it's a massive achievement, and you've done like everyone back here in the UK so proud. Um, I imagine you guys are absolutely buzzing after the, after, well, especially after that first game at the weekend. Yeah, hundred percent. It was a big achievement. That was the goal. Um, we wanted to qualify as a huge tournament, and after the first win, it was it was great. But to get the second win too was was something for pride, and we're happy we got it. Yeah. Was it was it, was it mean for you guys to like perform on that? international stage first of all and then secondly to qualify because I think it's like the th- only the fifth time that GB have managed to to qualify for that tournament yeah it's huge I mean I had an interview uh, yesterday just with a similar question and it's just I think GB have, have always been right there but could never really close out games and that kind of came uh, became our identity um, and I think especially over these last few years we, we've changed that and uh we're winning games now and, and we're competing uh, at the highest level in Europe. And uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely on the way up as a team. Yeah, I think I think like qualifying for the tournament like is definitely, I don't know about you guys from the inside, but from the outside, it's slowly helping that, you know, progression of British basketball, people's perceptions of British basketball. And obviously that combined with like the, the growth of the, the domestic game here in the UK as well, can only be a good thing for putting putting us on the map really, can't it? Yeah, yeah, I think it's it's showing people that we can play on an international level at, and win games. Um, so people are taking more interest in that. Obviously, they're looking up to us to to win those games, and we're we're executing, we're we're doing what we're meant to do. So it's growing the league, and we just want to keep doing that moving forward. I think like the most impressive thing about it is that you guys have dealt with a lot of adversity like throughout the whole process. Obviously, it's well documented about like the lack of funding in British basketball. You guys basically do it free of charge like you guys don't get paid I don't think people realize that but you know you guys do it for the passion of playing for your country and you know a lot of the other teams that are in your group like that that wasn't the case for them yeah uh I think there's a different vibe when it comes to playing for the national team um paid not paid uh it doesn't really matter especially with the group we've got now uh we're just playing for each other and for our country and um we're trying to do the best we can so um, although not having funding and stuff like that can challenge, uh, especially a lot of our support staff and the guys who help us. But um, yeah, we're ready to go, paid or not paid. We're, we're, we're playing for, for the name on the front of our shirt. So. I, think, I think it's pretty cool too. When we played France, they were all in like Jordan sponsored track suits and had elite gear and we were just in our sponsor stick. Shout out to our sponsors, a good thing anyway, but we're just comparing, you know. So that was fun. But then it gives us an underdog mentality. We've got nothing to lose and everything to prove. So we came out there, played hard and that's the, that's the mentality we've had for a long time now and it's, it's paying off now, I think. Yeah, and I think, I think that was also one of the toughest groups on paper as well. Like you had Germany, you have France, who are what, number six in the world. Obviously, you know, not, not with their, all their players playing, but still like a really, really tough game. Um, 
and also you having to do it in the middle of a pandemic as well like you, you know you're going into these bubbles like it's not the same without fans different kind of how like what what was that like in terms of the being in the bubble as well yeah it was good uh it was good it was it's different of course uh i mean being in the hotel all the time like you can't really get too much fresh air or, or or get away from the environment even if it's you go for a walk around the city or whatever but um it, it was good we i think we handled it well uh i think the biggest difference for me at the international level was the the fans because uh, in the in the international games it's another level of fans you know it's like so, football crowd isn't it like it's like rocky like you see those videos i mean you guys would have known from your time playing overseas as well but like sometimes like the 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 fans is it's basically like you, you see some fans like setting off flares in the crowd and things like that is mad isn't it i'd say that the fans helped us win that game a year ago against germany in newcastle yeah. you know it was tight uh we needed energy they were screaming it was a packed crowd so um the fans make all the difference in the world it's completely different playing with no fans, it's almost like a scrimmage friendly game, that environment. But I don't know, it, at the same time, it keeps you locked in with the team and focused on one goal, which we managed to do. And so it's, it's tough, but we, we got it done. That was a game you went off on it in that fourth quarter, I think it was. And uh, cash out. That, that, yeah, that one in Newcastle, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had a decent fourth quarter, but uh, it's all about winning games for us, man. Like, it, it, it's such a good vibe on our team. Like, no one cares about who gets what points or does whatever. Um, I mean, multiple years I sat on the bench for GB, uh, cheering away, uh, just cheering these guys on. And recently I'm, I'm playing more minutes, but it's just all about being collectively together. And, and like I said, playing for the, for Great Britain and, and the name on the front of our shirt. So. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest challenges as well that you guys have had to face is that you haven't had Nate Ranking there. Like you've had Mark Stutel come in and have to step up as head coach and a fantastic job um, alongside like Andreas as well, like as this assistant coach. I mean that that itself is a, is must be a massive challenge. Yeah, that's that was that was definitely a challenge. But I think the transition was kind of easy just because they were on the staff when Nate was there, so they have similar playing styles. Uh, they talk and communicate throughout uh, the, the year, throughout windows. And um, we even had a, a Zoom call with Nate as a team before this window, just to get everybody on the same page, to touch base with everybody. <clears throat> so that kind of thing was easy. And then having Andreas for us personally, I think is, is even better because we're here with him at Bristol Flyers every week, every day. So that uh, communication level is easy. He, he can communicate whatever to the, the other coaching staff. So it's comfortable to be in. And, and I think Mark did a great job. He needs a, a huge uh, congratulations and applause for what he's, he's been able to do. Yeah, man, Mark's done an amazing job. I mean, uh, just come in, embraced everyone, hasn't listened to everyone. Um, yeah, we we can't we don't think highly enough of of Mark. He's he's just a great guy as well. Uh, but yeah, he's come in and and he's played a big role big role in our team and and our success. Yeah, and what about Andreas? What's he like on the um, in the GB environment? Is any different to the Bristol Flyers environment at all, or is it very much the same? Uh, a little bit, a little bit. Obviously, he's head coach here, so much more vocal here, and and he takes a lead. Uh, a little less vocal with the national team, but he still does a great job for us. Um, does a lot of our scouts, uh, gets us really prepared for the games, and and just like Mark, he helps us. He helps us a ton, and he's welcomed everyone, and everyone's embraced him. Um, yeah, it's it's just a it's just a positive vibe when we're there, man. Everyone clicks, everyone gels. Uh, and that, and that's the reason we win ball games. I know we spoke about like the um, the lack of funding in British basketball, particularly at the elite level for you guys, and you know playing on the international stage and things like that. And like I know UK sport, like its main priorities when it's handing out funding, it's down to like Olympic medals, and they've never really considered things like qualification in in a like, Euro basket and things like that. I'll be interested to hear like what your thoughts are on the whole on the whole situation because like, at the end of the day, like. It's the most like the, the the fact goes around all the time like it's the most popular played team sport in the UK etc cetera, etc cetera, but it just doesn't seem to be the funding at that elite level. Why do you think that is, and 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 how do you think we can get over that sort of uh, that challenge? Um, I think it's tough to judge it on Olympic medals. I think, like you said, there needs to be an importance in qualifying because that's where it starts. You know, you you have to qualify, and I think maybe in the past we haven't done a great job winning games, so we've given them something to to stand on but now is uh, there shouldn't be any debate you know we've qualified and and we've won games that we've needed to um so i think it's just a, a matter of time before we do get funding i think over the time there's 
participation numbers have gone up, the views have gone up, the sponsorship deals have gone up, Sky News, uh, Sky Sports has put us on get on TV. So it's going in the right direction. I think, I don't know personally who we need to speak to, but I think there's a, there's an interest in funding the league more and I think eventually we'll get it when we need to. Yeah, I think on like a smaller scale that like you see like flyers every year, they're slowly building their, their 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 family of sponsors, and obviously with like the new arena on the horizon for for flyers, and other clubs in BBL as well, like are doing the same thing. Um, yeah, you certainly like to think that that mindset would change, like from the Olympic medals mindset to oh wait a minute, you know GB have just knocked off number six in the world here, and they've qualified for for European Championship and they've got World Cup qualifiers coming up like that like that should really be the criteria in my opinion oh yeah yeah for sure I mean you need funding to get to that point yeah it's like a vicious circle isn't it like to be it's top tough. three in the world is is ridiculous I mean it, it, it's so hard to get there um, and that takes decades of consistent funding consistent you know um, but yeah as di it's diff difficult to say funding for, for medals is I mean, it's easier said than done. I mean, we just played France. Um, granted, they didn't have their NBA guys. That was still a very good French team. I mean, they got Euroleague, Euroleague guys. They got the point guard for the Barcelona. Players, yeah, yeah. Uh, top league guys. So it's, I mean, for us to beat them, that, that has to, and not only just beat them, beat them by 20, um, has to say something about the sport and about uh, us as a team. So, uh, yeah, we need funding. Uh, and that's it, really. Especially, especially <laughs> to get to get there, you know. These other teams have every, like we just said, they sponsored by Jordan, whatever. Probably Charter getting flights, paid, flights, whatever. That. You need the resources. You need to get better to get guys into camp. Sometimes we don't even have a full squad in camp and stuff. And that comes down to funding. So if we can get people, more guys in camp, longer camps. Um, I remember it used to be like a month camp or six week camps before major tournaments. Now it's cut down to ten days and you're getting guys from different countries, which makes it very tough to to gel quick and win games. That's why it's been, not, it hasn't been a struggle as much because we've had the same core guys come. But moving forward, you'd, you'd like to have more uh, players to choose from, more players to get involved in the programme, and that way you can win more games and keep uh, a, a level, the level high moving forward and, and consistent. Yeah, I mean, you guys have been winning games right now, like 11 out of the last 13, I think it is, like in all the... All the recent windows and and it seems like the same group has stuck together throughout you know players could have easily just said look i'm not getting paid for this like i'm gonna be too busy here i mean you've got like like over here coming out of love island for example like so many opportunities there available but again like deciding to come and play for the national team that definitely says something it definitely looks like guys i think you touched on it earlier like guys have found their roles in the team as well like and, and a different role to what they necessarily play for their, their club team so a lot of these players for example are, are the main guys on their club team and then they're coming into GB and then they're having to play limited minutes and I think the fact that that you guys have all understood your roles and I think that's been one of the massive keys to your success so far yeah for sure I mean most of us grew up playing together so um, it's all familiar faces uh, and everyone everyone just buys in uh, like I said it doesn't matter who goes off what game um, we know roughly what everyone does and and they do it to the best of their ability and that's why we're winning games um, but yeah, we're 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 all on the same page for sure. Uh, I think too, we're, it's like it's fun, you know. It's like family. You grow up with the same guys. When you play every season, you're at a different team, different faces, and this is a team where you play for one goal, like for as long as you're on that team, you know. And it's the same guys, you're having fun. It's not it's not so much a break in the season, but it's like a mini break where you get to see your guys, your friends, your brothers, whoever you grew up with playing, and you have a goal and and to reach it. it makes you want to come back again and again and again regardless of your role like you said he was cheerleading one year and in the fourth quarter making threes to win games it's, it doesn't matter what happens it's a good experience whatever yeah i think uh, for, for you teddy as well like on a personal level like you notched a couple of milestones at the weekend so 49 consecutive games played which is incredible um and obviously 200 career assists as well now for the national team like did did you know that was those milestones are coming up or was it a I, bit like I didn't I didn't uh, Jamie Smith he's just that guy he knows everything GB so he let me know that before the window before like two windows ago so um, that's just my style of play the assists pass the ball I'm, I'm that's been my style of play to, to be a point point pass first point guard and then the milestone was just the uh, 49 games was kind of crazy you know because you have to stay healthy the entire time you have to kind of be available and. I don't know, it just aligned where 
I managed to, to do it and I'm happy pretty much. Yeah, no, nah, it's fantastic achievement. I think you're the leader now in assists as well for GB in terms of, is it Casey now just racking up that, uh, <laughs> yeah, racking yeah. up that number yeah, so yeah, no one yeah. else comes in and you're takes try, it yeah, over you're you. trying to stay in the record books as long as you can, you know, and then hopefully in a couple of years or whatever, somebody sitting there talking about, yeah, we broke Teddy's record, but I'm going to try, yeah. try to run it up a like little bit. Like the same way we're talking about <laughs> McInnes right yeah, now. Yeah. Like exactly. someone, yeah, and, and that's what it's all about, isn't it? Like inspiring the next generation in terms of like, I think after that Luke Nelson buzzer beater in that game, I think I saw a video on TikTok yeah. of a kid who was making like that, that lefty scoop layup and it had that crazy commentary on like, on the top. I think that like, that's what it's all about, isn't it? Like you, you fall on the international stage and then you want to see the next sort of players come through as well. Oh yeah, one hundred percent. Stuff like that is amazing, you know. Um, what the the layup Luke made was incredible, and then just to see little kids imitating it is, is yeah, is what you want to see in this country. I mean, we don't have enough of that. Uh, I don't know if it's because of exposure or what, but uh, at least it's happening, and hopefully we'll see more of it in the future. Yeah, how many times you watched the layup back on the uh, <laughs> on bunch, yeah, a lot, a, a lot, bunch, a man. I've hit. I have to admit, I've hit. <laughs> I've hit. Watch a lot on that video. Commentator went crazy. He went nuts, didn't he? <laughs> like talk us through that last play. Like what? What was? What was said in that timeout before Luke goes and makes the winner? Um, gee, I don't know. I, don't, I remember. I think uh, that's how he drew it up. But I, just to go before that, the last like four possessions. They well, didn't score, locked in, like, you know, defensively, we yeah. was down, oh, yeah. down two. So we needed a stop and Tariq then and Miles we got a stop, turned it stops. over, got a stop, missed the shot or turned it over again, got mm -hmm. another stop, tied it up or, or went up. And then I think they missed the shot, got an offensive rebound, laid it up. And then it was, I, I think know, we were in the bonus. So we wanted it. It was either going in Luke's or Obi's, Obi's hand, hand or Miles' hand. Yeah. Uh, and for them just to turn the corner, go downhill, try to get fouled or something. And uh, yeah, Luke just kissed it off the glass and that was it. What was like, I remember speaking to Andreas before the window started and he said that first game was always going to be the one to, to focus on because essentially you guys needed to, was it match Montenegro's results basically to be able to qualify? Yeah, we had the tiebreaker over that. Yeah, we had the tiebreaker over that. What was like the mindset of you guys going into that first game? It was pretty much a do or die game, really, wasn't it? <laughs> We knew we knew uh, if we won that game, pretty much we'd qualify. I mean, Montenegro would have had to have beaten France and Germany, I think. Yeah, they would have had to have gone two and zero in that window, and and beating France is tough. Um, and just going two and zero in the window is is really hard to do. So we thought if we pretty much if we won that Germany game, we would qualify for Eurobasket, and then well, we got back to the hotel. Yeah, yeah it was nerve wracking, man. Watching the, watching watching the, the France Montenegro, Montenegro game. game, yeah, we, oh, was yeah, in we the had it on the big screen, conference room, and we, they were up ten. Montenegro was like, "What are you doing, man? What's yeah, going on?" Yeah. <laughs> and then France finally came back on. Came one. back one, celebrated as soon as little, little celebration, little hit celebration. zeros. We were like, "Yes, we've." secure how many hours was it between you guys wrapping up against that germany game and then you guys essentially all sitting and watching that france game uh probably like an hour i think they played at 8 45 after yeah. us they had to clean the court and stuff like that um but yeah i mean going back to the hotel we had a good feeling because we thought for sure france were probably most likely gonna not blow out montenegro but get a comfortable win and then it was going down to the wire to the wire so yeah it was an intense night I think actually I think I saw um I don't know if it was Ovi or someone put a video out on the uh, Instagram story or something like that about like um the, the reaction or something oh, yeah, yeah. To, we, to to qualifying. When they finally got Yeah, it was cool, man. We was watching every time France made a shot, we was like yes, and every time Montenegro made one, we was like, No <laughs> you know. <laughs> but I don't know, we got we we managed to qualify and then we were just excited, man. We was in there proud of what we done because we controlled what we could. We got the win we needed to going into that first game and then the rest was out of our hands come the next game. And then when it when when France ended up winning that game, we were just over the moon. There was really no pressure as much as as much of the uh, personal kind of vendetta against right. France just to win, you yeah, know? There yeah, wasn't no yeah. pressure no more from the country or anybody to qualify. We knew we were in. It's tough because like imagine you guys like celebrate but then obviously you've still got that second game to go and although it's not, you know, not it's not necessarily a meaningless game, but it's another game you have to go through, another cap for you guys and you still need to stay locked in. Yeah, I think we 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 went into that game with more of a chip on our shoulder because of how they beat us in November. You know, they were they they beat us convincingly and it was a, it's on the main stage where you get to prove yourself against a high level team. So although we didn't have really nothing to play for in terms of to qualify or to prove anything, we, we wanted to play the right way and, and use them as a measuring stick to, to see how good we, we've been or we've come and to prove that that game last time wasn't a fluke, but 
it wasn't the best we can play. And I think we played really good on that day and managed to, to get a good win. Yeah, I think there was definitely a chip on our shoulder for sure. Uh, last game, there was a lot of, lot of uh, smack talking going on. Um, and they beat us by, what, 20, 20 last game? 20 what language is the trash talking? Is it in English? Oh, it's English, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was going to say. And, and they understand English. Too. Well, they understood this window. Um, but, yeah, it was, it was, they wanted to win and we wanted to win. It was, although we both qualified, that game was, probably had a little more edge than the Germany game, yeah, yeah, if yeah. anything. Because Germany had already, they automatically qualify. Um, so you got Miles and Ovi playing in France. They didn't really want to go yeah. back to France here in. Yeah, they got whooped again. You know, yeah. so it was like, yo, let's go and play. Let's go and compete. And the way we lost last time, and they were talking to us. Yeah, it was like okay. we owed them one, and and we did it. So uh, yeah, it felt good. It felt good. I think it's like, uh, it's, I mean, massive achievement. So like, congratulations again for you guys. Um, second time you guys are both playing at Eurobasket. Um, 2017 was the last one. I give it a quick Google. What do you remember from that last experience of Eurobasket? Like, I know you guys didn't come get get a win at that yeah, at, yeah. that tournament, but imagine that must have been like a massive experience for you guys. Did it almost give you like a chip on your shoulder to like want to come back again? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that was that was at the point when when GB was that team who, if you're playing against GB, it was like, all right, stick to the stick to our principles, uh, stick to the game plan, and we will win this game, uh, no matter what kind of thing and. And uh, now I think we've changed that kind of narrative. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it was a good experience. Um, we learned a lot from it. Uh, but again, it was one of those times when GB was just there, but could never really finish the ball game. Uh, and now, I mean, our record speaks for itself. We, we've turned that corner and, and we're winning now. So, What's the difference, do you feel like, between like the dynamic within the team, between like back then and, and the dynamic you guys have got right now? Um, I think we've just matured a little bit. We've got the same group of, same five, six, seven guys um, that's maybe played in that Eurobasket or that's been in the programme around that time. And we've just grown together. The chemistry has been much easier to have uh, when you're only rotating a couple guys versus changing a whole team, you know. And we've got a good mix of vets and younger guys. I think that's uh, the It, main, take, it the takes time thing. to win on that time, level, yeah. man. It's not like, you're talking like elite level, like, NBA and then you've got Eurobasket pretty much so it's 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 tough to win on that level no matter who you're playing uh but yeah I think we definitely definitely turned that corner and like Ted said it's it's just consistency within our group that that is our main strength right now do you think like qualifying for the Eurobasket next year was the highlight has that been the highlight of your like international careers or or what has been the highlight of playing for GB do you, do you feel for both of you qualifying is definitely up there uh, Eurobasket was my first like major tournament, so that was an experience that uh, I, I, I'd remember forever. You know, it's the first tournament in Turkey, fifteen thousand people, twenty thousand people playing against Turkey is kind of crazy. You know, it's an atmosphere you're not even you're not even used to at that at that stage in my career. So now I think qualifying is more of a seriousness and, and understanding what your goal is and how how to how to learn from those mistakes that we made in 2017 and come back and hopefully win some games and see how far we can go. I know like even just like looking on Twitter when you guys are playing, but it doesn't matter like what BBL club you support. It doesn't matter whether you like the BBL or not, but everyone within British basketball always comes together. I scroll from my timeline on Twitter and it's unbelievable the amount of support that you guys get. Like what's the reaction inside when you like finish a game and you're looking through the Twitter feed and you see all that kind of support from, from everyone in the British basketball community? Yeah, it's good. It's good. Um, I think we need that, and and they know that if we win games, it is it benefits everyone. You know, not just the national team. It benefits the league. It benefits the exposure and, and what people think uh, of Great Britain basketball as a as a culture. So uh, yeah, it, it's all positive. Um, I don't think too many guys are all all over the media because I think in past years we we've had a lot of criticism. Uh, some rightly so, some not. Not, um, but yeah, a a any support is is great for us, and uh, we just got to keep keep winning, keep improving. Um, you definitely like inspiring, and like I said, inspiring the next generation of, of of players coming through. And just like on that subject of of talking about the the next generation of of guys coming through, you've seen like Jacob Brown get minutes. 
in like the the latest window, like players like Cam Hildreth, Kareem Queeley as well, like you know, um, like on the fringe of the team as well, and and like Cam, for example, playing for Surrey as well, like which is massive, and, and using the BBL as a platform to, you know, to to prepare for his college at, experience at Wake Forest. Um, what what are your thoughts on like, who 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 the players we need to be watching out for in terms of coming up now through the the GB ranks? I'd say definitely Cam. Yeah. Um, the guys you mentioned, Cam, Kareem, Jacob. Obviously, Cam, I think he's got the, the most exposure right now, rightfully so. He's one of the, the best young players we have. Um, he's going to a big-time school. I think uh, Kareem, with his experience of where he's played and, and his trajectory on what he should be doing, is, is exciting to see too. I think he's a he's a great guard. He's, he's I don't know, he's, he's going to be very good. Jacob obviously has experience too and being around the, the team more and more, he's going to grow quicker and he's not, he, he doesn't have a fear factor where he just, he's timid or anything. He's a little quiet, but he plays like, he goes at it, he guards, tough. he's yeah, he's a tough kid and he can shoot the ball pretty well. So once he gets more out of his shell, I think that's a name that people are going to be like, oh, this kid, I remember when he was playing three, four minutes and now he's doing this. It's crazy. I remember when we were like the young guys, like, it's weird. Yeah, now, like now we're the old guys. Yeah. I'm, on, I'm, I'm, on, know. I'm in the middle right now. Wait, and I'm you're an old guy. What's like, um, like what? What do you remember about like your first time you got called up to the GB team and then you having to go through? Do you do like, do you like initiations or anything like that? Or is there anything that you make the guys do when they come in for the first time? Yeah, they got a sing the national, yeah. national anthem in a in a restaurant or something in front of everyone. Just turn the music on and stand up yeah. and <laughs> get it cracking. What was your What was your one like? What, Whereabouts were you when you did your one? Uh, where was I? I don't know where mine I was. Mine was pretty. Mine was pretty where cool. Where was yours? Mine was, I think, was in maybe kind. Of, uh, was it East London? Maybe Who kind did of you do town. It I, I had like ten guys that were brand new. Oh, I remember that. that yeah, twenty yeah. yeah, twenty fifteen. So we split up into like two groups and did like a, a concert kind of thing. Yeah. We did like a remix. <laughs> I a think remix it was just me and X Factor. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We did like a remix. <laughs> me and Paul Guaid, yeah. I think. But some guys, some guys have come and they've been the only new face at camp, and they have to do it by themselves. Oh yeah, kind of we crazy. got Cam to do it. Cam, Cam did well. To Cam be did fair. well. Yeah, he stood up on a Coaches chair. Coaches got to do it. Everybody, really? physios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Pretty cool. Camera guys. Fun guy. If you guys come, you guys. Yeah, it's fun. That's what they need. They need to if they, if you know if anyone for GB is listening and they need <laughs> yeah, any yeah, content right. creators, you right, know my DMs are open. Just hit me up. Yeah, we need we need it. We need yeah, it. Yeah. You've been going crazy with the content, so talking about like the the crop of like GB players and speaking of BBL as well. You see like Cam Hildreth play, playing in the BBL, um, using it as a platform to move on. But then you also have players that have like come back into the BBL, like you guys, for example, and and um, Ash Hamilton and Justin Robinson, for example. If you're looking at like the um, the the current GB squad, who who do you feel could be the next player? To, to make that step back into the BBL and, and what kind of environment does it need to be in to be able to bring these players back home like yourselves? Uh, we talk about that all the time. We always wish we always wish the uh, the GB team could make a, a a BBL team, you know, and we could play together. Maybe maybe in the future, who knows? But um, who on our team? I don't. As of right now, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah. They're all they're all doing pretty well in Europe, so I, I don't think they'll be leaving anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, if I'm honest. Um, what does it take? Like, what kind of environment? Uh, out of curiosity, like, what if you were to say, like, let's let, let's do a LeBron and like call all our mates and say, mm. let's all go play at Bristol Flyers, for example. What kind of like, what's the checklist that you're looking for? Is it is it just about like good pay or is it like no, a good think, environment or yeah. a good like? Um, good I think it's more like a, a long term plan kind of thing. However long that is, if that's three years, five years, I don't know. But probably more. What's the goal of the team? Where are you playing? Um, what's the facilities like? You know, things that that you that's a norm in other countries, kind of thing. Um, things think, like yeah. playing potentially a European competition. I know some clubs have tried to do that in the past. The uh, Lions, uh, uh, Leicester's done it, I think, uh, in qualifying games. So I think if that's like the mission and that's like a concrete thing, I think we've got the talent to do it. When from from British-born players. I think we've got the mm, talent to sure. do it, if they're especially on the same team. For sure. um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, uh, obviously money is a huge thing. Uh, guys aren't just going to come play for anything really. Um, but if you get the money thing out the way, which is easier said than done, uh, like Ted said, playing in Europe for sure, uh, that would have to be the goal. Uh, and pretty quickly, I would say, yeah. if you were to bring guys back. And there's no doubt we'd compete in Europe, no yeah, doubt. Yeah. I think a lot of guys are in their prime, so that's just the trade-off right now. It's like, do I stay over here in my prime and 
I don't know, make as much as I can and build this, playing the highest levels that I can because that's the opportunities available versus coming home and then trying to build that. I don't, that's the biggest decision I think a lot of players have to, to make and think about when they're playing. Yeah, which player can you kind of see from the current setup at GB that would, would make that step back in the near future, if any? I don't know. I think it would be a collective effort. If it, I don't think it would be one guy or whatever. I think it would have to be like five, six, seven guys all on the same page. Yeah. Um, same. Yeah. If only there was like some kind of like British basketball team that had really ambitious plans to play in Europe <laughs> and arena coming on the way. And <laughs> right, yeah, right, right, right. Had like an assistant coach on the national team or yeah, something. Yeah, a couple, couple of guys <laughs> on the current team. Yeah, right. That's it. Uh, let's see if, uh, if John Lansdowne's listening to this, you know what to do. <laughs> so, I mean, you guys have obviously um, now qualified for Eurobasket. What does that, what do the next few windows look like? Of course, you've got um, World Cup qualifiers coming up now as well, haven't you? Uh, November, right? November. I think they're doing the draw maybe next month for who's going to be in our group. Yeah. And then that, that's all so we know right another now. Another statement window, really, to qualify for that, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and with the, the momentum we've got right now, there's no reason uh, why we can't go qualify for the World Cup, for sure. That would be huge. Yeah. Are you guys both looking at, uh, uh, now you guys have qualified, is that a big target now for you guys to, to be in that squad or continue being in that squad for Eurobasket 2022? Oh, for sure, for 100%. sure. 100%. I need that 50. <laughs> I need you got to get that, I need, keep I that record going. I've got to get that 50 and keep it going a little bit. but got to rack up those assists as yeah, well and yeah. like make it harder to reach. Yeah, but you definitely want to be playing those major tournaments. That's that's a, that's a testament to all the work you put in before, you know. Mm -hmm. So qualifying for, going to qualifiers and training camps and stuff is, is what you play for to get into those tournaments. So we definitely want to be in that tournament. And I don't think the team will be too, di too much different for Eurobasket. I think there'll be a couple added guys um, but I think the guys who have taken us through this these windows, it'll be majority of them for sure. Because uh, we don't we don't have Euroleague guys, we don't have an NBA guy. Our strength is is in numbers and and playing together. Uh, so I, I really see it being a similar team to we've got now that we've got now, uh, bar a few few e extra guys, a uh, couple guys that we'll bring in. What are your thoughts on like the head coaching position? Could you see Mark Stutel being being named like head coach going forward? Potentially, I think. I think. Uh, yeah, I, I don't see why not. I think we, Nate needs credit too, though. I think uh, when we played for him, I think his record is like four and zero or something like that. So uh, it's just unfortunate with the NBA schedule, he can't come over at the yeah. same time. But I think the the what's made it so easy for the players and the coaches is we both have the same goal, and nobody's got an ego, so I, they they don't care who's coaching as long as the the goal's the same and everybody's bought in. After the game, Nate texts us individually and says congrats on the win. Um, the same way uh, Mark do is emotional after a win, you know. So whoever we're playing for, we're, we're, our goal is the same and we're going to play with the same amount of passion, I think, and just keep elevating, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's the goal. Yeah, just kind of like shifting gears. Like, um, Have you guys thought about what you guys want to do after you finish playing basketball at all? Uh yeah, potentially coach. Yeah. Uh in probably in the states. Um but yeah, probably it just it kind of makes sense to to go and coach. Uh and I think especially uh for someone who's played in Europe uh and understands the European game, I think you can add a lot to to the American game. Um because I don't know, every year there's more and more Europeans in the NBA and having successful careers in the NBA. So I think there's definitely a, a gap in the market there for, for European coaches to coach maybe at the college level or high school level. So, uh, But yeah, I haven't put a crazy amount of thought into it. It's, it's hard because basketball uh, like consumes your life, you know? Yeah. Um, I know but I, haven't, I haven't put that much. I haven't put a crazy amount. I think uh, for me, maybe coaching, maybe just staying around basketball, saying something in sports for sure. Um, I've done a couple of interviews in the past week and that's been really cool. So maybe getting to your little podcast world would be... Yeah, like join the sick, media you know? world. Like, yeah, like, yeah, you, you, see lot, you lots of players like, I mean, like, like Joe Akeem does his Twitch yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, like you see players right now doing like the pundit tree on Sky Sports. I think Gina Crandall was like the, the pundit on the Sky coverage the other Teddy, week. Teddy would be great in the media. Yeah, <laughs> maybe a, do some media. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maybe do some media, you know, give back. I don't know, some, something cool. I'm going to just something disappear cool. into the country. <laughs> <laughs> something fun, yeah. No, I definitely want to stay around the sports. It's... it's 
it's been my life growing up the entire time so yeah and it's it's got so many avenues in it we can go coaching you can go media you can go i don't know whatever podcasts or yeah, talking like, about experience everything so yeah yeah like some players go into the business world and like become like club execs and like what you know um agents gms, GMs you know yeah, what i mean yeah, things that like that kind of stuff, yeah. i've thought i've thought about gm GMs when you when you job. i know they're tough jobs but when you play like games and you pick in your team and how would you build your team kind yeah. of thing yeah it's like little things but i don't know we'll see what the future holds there are no concrete plans right now yeah and i know, tell you you've done a little bit of stuff is it with talk sport um, yeah, yeah, yeah. tell us a bit about that I uh, did an interview with them and I'm going to start next week like doing a little roundup on the BBL like I think every fortnight on the BBL and, and NBA so that's going to be exciting see how that goes see how far we can take it and then whatever opportunities open up from there we can explore that's awesome how can uh, how can the listeners tune into that is it just every is it every, I every think week? Thursday every Thursday at 2 or 2.30 I'll, I'll get the details and I'll tweet the link put it on social media so everybody knows uh, awesome look out for it Really good stuff. Yeah. Um, what, what's your Instagram? <laughs> Teddy, okay, five. All right. Everyone go follow. <laughs> what about like what you guys like to do in your spare time? Like what do you like outside of basketball completely off the court? Like what do you like to do? Like, I know you guys speak about it. We, when we talk about it a bit, quite a bit, like playing a bit of Warzone or like yeah, playing yeah. a bit of Xbox, etc. What What are your passions? Um, Warzone. I don't know. Yeah. I like, I like playing Warzone. I've, I've only recently started playing it more because of lockdown. Uh, I was yeah, terrible sure, before, yeah, so I, I started playing it more. Recently, now I'm proper into cooking. I watch all the little cooking videos on Instagram. Yeah, I see so, on the yeah, your like, stories, like do, posting yeah. some of your. Uh, I watch all them little recipes and then try and do them. I'm going to try to do this little feta with cherry tomato pasta that everybody's been posting and see what that looks like. But not not much to do right now with lockdown. So It's tough, isn't it? Yeah, what about you, Ben? Well, what, what are you doing outside of uh, playing at the moment? Uh, yeah, I mean, me and Ted obviously live together, so uh, pretty much the same stuff. But outside of lockdown, I don't know. I like going to the country. I like exploring, beach, all, all that stuff. Um, Something just kind of opposite of basketball. Yeah, getting Take away, off, getting yeah. away from it, really. Yeah. Um, just clearing your clearing your mind and stuff. Yeah, and obviously just um, I'm just quickly looking ahead to like in terms of bringing it back to flyers. Um, busy schedule coming up these next two months. I think it's like nine games coming up in March. Um, have you ever been like on a team with a schedule that busy before? I haven't, no. I think we've got like six in the next 17 days. It's For me, it's interesting playing in Europe. You see, that's what a lot of teams do when they play Champions League or European competition. So for me, it's like a, a taste of what that would be like. And then for young people listening or, or going up through the same path, that's what you could expect. And that's what your body almost has to be ready for like two, three games a week, if you want to play at the highest, highest level. And NBA players play back to back to back some days or so whatever. So I think it's interesting. It's, it's a lot on your body, so you have to be ready for it. But we're excited. It makes it makes it fun, you know. You ain't got to worry about sitting on a loss or a win for a whole week. You can just move on to the next, go on to the next game, yeah. on to the next game, which yeah, keeps yeah, you in sure. rhythm, keeps you good. Yeah. Have you found playing on the same team? Is this like the first time you guys have been on the same team outside of GB? Yeah, it's good. I mean, it's always a pleasure playing with Ted. Uh, he's always finding guys, you know, uh, consistent point guard. I mean, the, his his latest record for GB just shows that uh, consistently playing at a high level. Um, yeah, it's always a pleasure. Yeah. He's a pass me the ball a little bit more. But. <laughs> <laughs> they say you never really know someone until you're around them like 24-7 and I guess for you guys like living with <laughs> yeah, each other as well. Other, like yeah. it must be, uh, are you learning a lot about each other now that like you're in the same house and you're playing for the same team together and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's been cool, man. It's been cool, especially when you're a point guard. You, this is a guy who scores the ball, makes shots, so keeps each other level-headed. Win, lose, whatever. It's it's been fun. Yeah, I think we've just been through so much, like, Sound like with the national team. relationship or something. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We've been, we've been through hard times, you know, uh, good times. But yeah, I think yeah, we just what I mean, how many countries we travel to together, like sort of like. I don't know. Again, it goes back to the national team. Like we're all like super close, uh, like brothers almost. So uh, yeah, it's it's natural just playing together and whatever. So yeah, just to wrap things up, I, I we put a post out on social media. We asked some of the fans to send in their questions. So I got some quick fire questions from okay. from uh, some of the supporters. Uh, what's been the strangest part about the whole behind closed doors thing this season? Do you feel? Um. Strangest part. Fans, it's got to be the fans. fans. Yeah, hundred percent. It's I so weird yeah. playing without fans. Uh, both sides, when they're with you and when they're against you, uh, you feed off of that. So, uh, yeah, it has to yeah, be the, the fans. energy of the fans. Yeah. 
does it feel a bit like school all over again when you like when you're playing junior level and you've yeah. got like you've got you nobody know, in you, there. You, you, your parents and the uh, parents what in the sports or when that's it sometimes even even big plays like somebody might catch a alley oop or something and then everybody's just like yeah and it's like five <laughs> five voices you know because like you got to spring back on defense so there's only six guys on the bench that go yeah, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like okay it's great. like a preseason. Yeah, feel, it's like great. So. <laughs> yeah. um, got a question here from uh, Curtis Campbell on Instagram. He wants to know who's your basketball inspiration. Inspiration. Um, growing up, my one was Chris Paul and Jason Kidd. That's who I try to play like, watch the most. Do you try and like emulate your games around like NBA players? Do you feel, or do, were there certain players that like, like you say, the players that you used to look up to, Ben, when you modeled your game around or a certain player or anything like that? Um, that's who I, got I wouldn't to see say most, crazy yeah. amount. Like obviously Michael Jordan, yeah. but everyone, everyone knew. There wasn't a whole amount of coverage of of NBA guys when I was growing up. So uh, you could go like see highlights and stuff. But no, I mean, the, when did when was YouTube around? Yeah, like, there's no leap pass like that then. And like yeah, y so. you having to like record it on like the the videotape at like five in the morning or whatever, and try and watch it back yeah. on like channel five. the old it? Michael Jordan videotapes and nice. all that, but. Yeah, I wouldn't say there was a whole lot of people I, I tried to imitate, really. And when I started getting older, then then I could take people, parts of people's games and maybe try and imitate them. But especially when I was younger, it was just really Michael Jordan and the the big, big names. Yeah. Uh, I've got another question here from Instagram. Uh, who is the best player you've ever played against in your career? Um, in my career, probably Shved at Eurobasket 2017 gave us a nice 30 piece. Yeah, Shved um, was tough. He played really good. Well, Obviously, a Euroleague uh, scoring title person, so that's probably the toughest guard. I'm trying to think in high school and college. Such There's a, a bunch of NBA players, but probably the toughest had to have been some of the guys at, at Eurobasket. Yeah, it's, it's like such a small, but if you think about the basketball world, it's so small. Like someone's played with someone who's on the t same team as someone else at some point. Yeah, right. you know, yeah like for sure. Everyone knows each other somehow yeah, yeah, yeah. Through, through basketball. Got another question here from Instagram. What, what was it that made you choose basketball growing up? And did you play any other sports sort of growing up as well? Uh, I played football. Well, everybody played football, I feel like. But it's like six, seven, five years old. And then, I don't know, around nine, ten, my brother started playing it. So I just copied what he did. And then it grew from there. But I fell in love with basketball because it was like smaller. The community was smaller. And then uh, that's how I kind of got into it. Yeah, same for me. My my older brother played it. Uh, and I just started playing it. Obviously, I played football, a bit of rugby, uh, a little bit of everything, really. But, yeah, just ended up basketball side just kind of taken over and became my passion really yeah got uh, one final question here this is a good one uh it's from uh vlad at cheshire and he goes uh it's the eurobasket 2022 final gb needs one bucket to win it who steps up ben mockfield or teddy or career for oh tough i think it's gonna be a play by both of us I think Teddy's going to drive and kick <laughs> yeah. it to me and I'm going to make it. Yeah. yeah, Or he could drive and kick it to me in the yeah. corner like uh, he yeah, just he did against last, Germany last window, and so. I'll make it. So whoever's, all, whoever's yeah, got the ball. We're both involved in the play, put it yeah, that way. Yeah, yeah. You're, uh, one way or another, someone's someone's making it and assist someone's, or a someone's, someone's assist dropping the assist. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Fellas, I think that's like a really good place to wrap things up. Um, firstly, thanks so much for your time and congrats again on making it to Eurobasket. Uh, best of luck for the rest of the year with Bristol Flyers. Um, in these upcoming games. Appreciate it. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks, Thanks for having us. us.